All right, well, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation, and uh, thanks for putting on a great meeting. It's been really fun to watch this meeting grow over the years and become the, the great meeting it is uh, for stem cell research in the world, and very exciting to hear about all the uh, advances that are being made so rapidly in the field. Uh, I'm going to tell you about Regenerative Patch Technologies, LLC. Uh, this is a, a company that was formed in, in 2011, and uh, its focus is stem cell-based therapies for ocular disease, in particular the dry form of age-related macular degeneration, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And it's a spinoff of a CIRM-funded project called the California Project to Cure Blindness, which uh, includes uh, a number of institutions uh, led by Mark Humayan at USC, uh, including and includes UCSB, Caltech, City of Hope, and Regenerative Patch Technologies. And uh, we received a CIRM uh, Disease Team 1 grant to fund the IND enabling studies. Our IND was cleared by the FDA in March of, of this year, and uh, we now are operating on a CIRM Disease Team 3 grant to fund the Phase 1 slash 2A clinical trial, which will be starting soon. First, let me give you a little bit of background about the dry form of macular degeneration. When you go into the optometrist and they give you that bright flash, kind of like I'm getting right now from these lights, uh, they look at a fundus photo, a surface of your retina. And if you have early AMD, you see these little spots called drusen you can see in the middle picture. And it can progress to uh, two forms. The dry form is the most common, uh, and about 80 to 90 percent of the patients have that, and the wet form is less common. And we know a little bit about what causes the disease, and uh, most agree that it's dysfunction and death of a cell called the retinal pigmented epithelium, or RPE, in the back of the eye, and also degeneration of Brooks membrane, which is the extracellular matrix that the RPE sit on. Uh, so our hypothesis is that if we can replace these RPE, we can prevent the subsequent loss of photoreceptors and then loss of vision in the dry form. And uh, um, just to tell you a little more about the RPE, you can actually see these cells. If you look into the eye of the person next to you and look in the pupil, which is black, you're looking at this pigmented monolayer in back of the retina that's shown in the schematic on the left. And it carries out super important support functions for the photoreceptors. If you don't have RPE, your photoreceptors die. One really important thing it does every morning when uh, light hits your eye, it carries out a phagocytosis event of shed little bits of the outer segments of the rods and cones. And if you don't do that, you'll eventually uh, go blind. So a very important cell that's a, a nurse made of the rods and cones. And uh, other talks have talked about geographic atrophy, which is the end stage of the dry form of, of AMD. It's a, a large market opportunity. And if you look at the sales at the bottom of Lucentis, which is used to treat the wet form of AMD, uh, we think that uh, if we can come up with a, a good therapy for the dry form, it would have uh, an equal value. And a lot of people think this is a good idea. And you've heard about at this, at this meeting several companies and, and groups that are going after the dry form of AMD and are in various phases of clinical development and clinical trial. People are trying suspensions of RPE, injecting them into the subretinal space, which is the space between the RPE and photoreceptors. People are trying suspensions of other cell types like neural progenitor cells or cord blood, mesenchymal cells. And other groups are trying monolayers, growing the cells as monolayers and, and implanting them. Uh, uh, both autologous and allogeneic, and some using scaffolds and some not using scaffolds. Our approach is uh, to use a polarized monolayer of HES-derived RPE cells on a scaffold. And our scaffold is a biostable substance called perylene, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. And we've uh, engineered it to be ultra-thin to allow diffusion of nutrients uh, from the blood. Uh, we, we grow the RP cells for 30 days on the perylene uh, uh, membrane, and you can see a picture of one. It's about 6 by 3.5 millimeters, so smaller than the size of a penny. And uh, those cells are grown for 30 days such that they form a, a confluent, polarized uh, monolayer on the scaffold. And the idea is that when 
you have damage to your RPE and Brooks membrane, uh, and cells start to die, you go in and replace both of those. You replace the RPE cells along with a, a substrate that uh, allows them to have a survival advantage. So why polarized RP on a scaffold instead of uh, suspension of cells? It would certainly be much easier to inject just a, a bolus injection of cells. Well, studies have shown over the years that polarized RPE express RPE genes and carry out RP functions to a greater extent than cells in suspension. If you look at the bottom of the left, you can see staining for the factor PEDF, which is secreted in large amounts by polarized RP, but not very much at all by non-polarized uh, RPE. And why perylene? This is a biostable scaffold. Well, this has already been approved for use in the eye. It's a USP class six uh, substance used for over 30 years. And our collaborators at Caltech have machined it to have ultra thin regions, as I mentioned, that uh, have the same permeability as the normal Brooks membrane. It also allows folding of the implant to allow uh, a better uh, surgical approach. And we've shown in preclinical studies in the rat that if you uh, implant as a monolayer on, on a scaffold, the cells survive longer than if they're injected in a bolus injection. We've worked out methods to differentiate HES cells into RPE, and we're uh, using the H9 line of cells from the University of Wisconsin, uh, which uh, can be uh, induced to uh, differentiate into RP. And you can see in, in panel A on the left, a culture where we haven't enriched the cells. And we've devised methods where we can get about 30 to 50% of the cells becoming RPE. And you can easily distinguish them because they're pigmented. And then using methods of enrichment and further culture, we can get cultures that are 99% positive for RPE markers. And if we grow these for 30 days, they're fully differentiated, polarized, uh, they're functional, and they're not dividing or migrating. And you can see in the right staining for the RP marker PMEL. <clears throat> and very importantly, we can't detect any undifferentiated HES markers using very sensitive methods that we've used, uh, developed to, to look at potential contaminants. And we've never seen tumor formation in any of the animal studies that we've done. We've uh, transferred this method to our GMP facility uh, at our collaborators at City of Hope and have uh, devised a method where we grow these cells uh, and make an intermediate cell bank that can be cryopreserved. And then those vials are thawed and cultured on the perylene for 30 days and then uh, transferred to the point of care. And we only need uh, about 100,000 RP cells for each implant, so we don't need too many cells for each patient. And each patient would just get one implant. Uh, we'd like to eventually work out methods to cryopreserve at the final step to allow uh, shipment to a wider variety of sites and over a longer time period. Proof of concept, we've, like others, have used the RCS rat model which uh, is uh, a rat that has a mutation in the MER-TK receptor and lacks the ability to phagocytose the outer segments. And uh, the photoreceptors, as a result, degenerate after 12 weeks, resulting in blindness. And the experiment is to implant our, uh, our product at postnatal day 28 <clears throat> and then measure a variety of parameters to see if we can preserve the photoreceptors in the rat model. And I'll just show you a couple pieces of data. I mentioned this phagocytosis activity that's crucial for vision. And what we can see in the rat on the top left, you can see in the transplanted RPE on the perylene, <clears throat> uh, the red phagosomes, which have been stained for rhodopsin, which came from bits of the outer segment, compared to at the bottom, the host RP, which does not phagocytose at all. Uh, other ways of looking at function involve recording in the brain. And of course, there's a, a map of the retina and the superior colliculus. And what we've been able to do is record in the brain in the regions that correspond to where the implant lies within the retina or behind the retina. And if you look at this uh, number of, of locations showing a visual response uh, in that region, the perylene with cells shows a much higher response than either the control or the perylene only. 
how are we going to do this? Well, to work out the surgical method, <coughs> we've turned to the Yucatan mini pig model, which has an eyeball about the same size as a human. And what you're seeing here is a video from Rodrigo Brandt and Mark Humayan's lab uh, in showing the uh, placement of the patch in the pig eye. And first what's done is to remove the vitreous in the middle. Some fluid is injected to separate the retina from the RPE behind it. And then a small little uh, retinotomy is made to create a path into the subretinal space. Here's our patch sitting on top of the eye, and we developed a surgical tool that's basically a forceps inside a cannula that can pull the patch inside the cannula, and it folds up like a taco and protects the cells. And that can be inserted in the side of the eye through the retinotomy, and the patch is then extruded very carefully. Uh, to place it in the subretinal space. And the idea is to de deliver this to the region where the RP cells have degenerated or are degenerating and give them brand new uh, polarized RPE <coughs> ready to go. Now, I don't know about you, but I get a little nervous when I see a sharp object near my eyeball, but the surgeons are confident that they can do this in an outpatient procedure in about an hour. Okay, so... Uh, in our preclinical studies, uh, we've looked at efficacy and, and local toxicity. We have done a series of studies on tumor genicity, and again, as I mentioned, saw no evidence of any tumors and, and no evidence of systemic toxicity, and uh, the cells stay where we put them. Uh, the FDA wanted us to do uh, pig delivery studies to show we could deliver properly, and human postmortem eye delivery study as well. And uh, we also did studies to make sure that that mechanism of injecting, loading the injector and extruding the cells doesn't stress the cells. And we established the activity and safety of this product in our IND, which was 3,300 pages long and uh, was eventually um, cleared by the FDA. <clears throat> So our phase 1-2-A clinical study is, uh, is uh, about to start. It'll be uh, 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 done at USC uh, Eye Institute. It'll have two cohorts. The first cohort will have visual acuity of less than 2,400, and the second cohort less than 2,100. And we're talking about a single dose here, uh, a one-time implant. Uh, the primary endpoint, of course, will be safety and tolerability. Secondary endpoint will look at visual function. And because the dry form of AMD is a slowly progressing disease, our endpoint is uh, uh, after one year after um, implant. So uh, we're excited that uh, we've progressed uh, to this stage and, and uh, um, uh, excited to start the clinical trial. I'd like to end just by acknowledging the great team of uh, universities and people at various places that have made up the California Project to Cure Blindness and especially thank the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine for their funding. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.